Hi friends, so Mumu's parent company, Futu Holdings Limited, just released their Q4 2022 quarterly earnings report. And since everyone is still recovering from the banking crisis, I thought why not make a video to analyze their financials to see whether they are in a healthy financial position or if there's any red flag that you need to worry about because the devil is always in the details, right? As always, full disclosure up front, this video is not sponsored by Mumu and they have no idea I'm making it at all. You will be watching this video at the same time as them so rest assured whatever opinion i'm sharing with you in this video is not influenced by anyone whatsoever and they are all based on the latest and past earnings result i do have an affiliate link down below where i will receive a tiny bit of commission if you do check it out Thank you very much. Okay, let's get right into it. Let's start with their Q4 and 2022 full year highlights. This is where you can get a bird's eye view of all the company's key metrics. Q4 is basically the three month period ranging from the 1st of September to the 31st of December 2022. They are all quoted in thousands of Hong Kong dollar. So for what it's worth, I'll be presenting most of them in terms of percentage growth or decline so it's much more relatable to you and takes away the confusion of all the currencies so all across the board as you can see here 2022 was all in all a good year for them total number of paying clients registered clients and users increased over 10 percent year over year that's good for them because mumu is a retail first broker so number of clients definitely makes a lot of impact to their business and total client assets also increased 2.4 percent year over year that's a marginal increase but a win is a win, right? Now, this is where things get interesting. Total trading volume in Q4 declined 10.9% year over year, and their daily average revenue trades that also declined 12.7% year over year. And while I would say that this is generally a bad sign because lesser trades with a broker means lesser revenue and profit for them, we must not forget that a Q4 2022 or just 2022 in general is a bad year for the stock market, where we saw the S&P 500 index drop almost 20% in that year alone. So it's normal for retail investors or just the general public to stay away from the financial market during a bear market it's just how it is in fact my finance and investment videos are kind of in the same boat as well the views go up during a bull market and likewise the views go down during a bear market that's just how the industry works in nature and that is why you see they have margin financing and securities lending balance which are basically margin loan for the traders also declined 12.2% year over year and that just shows you how people turn from risk on mode to risk off mode when the market is in a downtrend. Now let's look at their financial statements in detail. From their profit and loss statement, we can see that their Q4 total revenue from commission, interest income and other income grew 42% year over year despite a challenging year of 2022 to almost every section of the stock market because of the aggressive rate hikes by the US Fed Federal Reserve, where we saw the interest rate grew from near zero level to almost 5% in just 12 months time. And while it's normal for interest income to grow thanks to the interest rate, I'm actually surprised their revenue from commission grew because technically it should decline as retail investors are more afraid of the stock market and make less trades. But this was actually explained by their report where they have increased their blended commission rate from 7 bips to 9.6 bips or basis point. It's quite a jump and could be bad for them in the long run because retail brokers like Momo or Webull or eToro are very competitive with their commission rates. And in the cost section, I've also noticed their interest expenses jumped up a whopping 227%. Again, no thanks to the rate hikes in 2022, which increased the cost of funds for every financial institution. And Momo is unfortunately just one of them. And selling and marketing expenses actually declined more than half the previous year because they said there are fewer new paying clients and lower customer acquisition costs. In my opinion, that's only partly true because when you spend less on marketing and advertisements, of course, your customer acquisition cost or CAC, we call it the CAC, will be lower. And if any company says their marketing expenses are so efficient that they have so much lower CAC, then obviously they can run more marketing campaigns to gain more customers, right? So this is clearly a calculated move by the management to cut down on their marketing expenses as the market went south in 2022. As you can see here, their year-over-year -year OPEX or operational expenses is practically 
flat. And even in the earnings call, their CFO answered analysts that they deliberately slowed down client acquisition to focus on improving client quality. See what they did there? But overall, I think it's a pretty prudent move in terms of cost control. And Momo, if there are now fewer paying clients, you know who to find. Anyways, if you guys want Momo to sponsor more of my videos, then please do comment down below for them to see. And the last thing on their PL is their earnings per share. I think it only makes sense if you look at it on a yearly trend where you can see them actually growing their EPS over the past four quarters from 3.84 to 6.80. That's almost double in terms of their bottom line. Pretty solid and combinable growth in my opinion. And over to their balance sheet, this is where we can see how healthy they are as a company because profitability alone does not equate to good financial standing. We need to see both of them together to paint a clearer picture. And in terms of their cash and cash equivalents, it actually grew by 10% year over year and they now have about $645 million of liquid cash on hand. Short-term investments, which are basically short-term bonds that they can quickly sell off, actually declined 42% year over year. But to be fair, it's still at a relatively small amount of $86 million US dollars. So in my opinion, it's not a red flag. And now one thing that most people will be familiar with is the long-term investments part in the non-current assets section. And in case you're wondering why I said that, the long-term bonds are basically the poison that eventually collapsed Silicon Valley Bank in early March when all their long-term bonds went underwater and crashed in prices after the Fed raised rates aggressively in 2022. So all the bonds that they bought in 2020 and 2021 was basically worth half of what they worth. And that caused all the panic withdrawal and the eventual collapse of SVB, banking crisis and whatnot. So in this case, it actually drew my attention when I saw they increased their long-term investments by tenfold in 2022 from about 23 million to 240 million Hong Kong dollar. But that's actually just about 31 million US dollar, which is still a rather small amount in comparison to their liquid cash position. Plus, these long-term bonds could be a mix of term deposits, treasury bonds and whatnot, which are mostly committed in 2022. So Momo users, I think we can all be assured that they are not in the same position as Silicon Valley Bank. And liabilities wise, which basically means how much debt they owe, they actually reduced their borrowings by more than 60%. So it's a good sight to see that they are now less dependent on debt to fund their operations ever since they turned profitable in 2018. And just to apply a few quick financial ratio analysis, right? their current ratio, which is basically you take current assets divided by current liabilities. Anything more than 1.0 means they have enough money to pay down any short-term obligations. That stands at 1.27 as of the end of 2022, which is actually slightly better than the 1.25 at the end of 2021. And their debt to equity ratio, which is the total liabilities divided by total shareholders equity that tells you how much the company relies on debt to fund their operations. Well, as of the end of 2022, that stands at 3.53, which is a significant improvement from the 3.84 in the previous year. So I think you can see that they are now less reliant on debt to fund their operations, like I said earlier, since the liabilities portion is now lesser. It's a good thing to see. And just to give you a sense of it, right? Interactive Brokers debt to equity ratio stands at 3.14. So in my opinion, that's a pretty good number considering they are a much smaller organization compared to Interactive Brokers. So let's take a step back and look at them from a big picture. We can see that their market capitalization or market cap actually grew 20% year over year. Or if you scoop it down further, then they actually grew by about 27% over the past 6 months. And that is actually a really strong growth considering we are all in the midst of recovering from the collapse of the US banks like Silvergate Bank, Silicon Valley Bank, Signature Bank, etc. etc. And if you were to compare to other financial institutions, the most relatable comparison company that is also public listed would be interactive brokers. They also grew by about the same 20 over percent for the past six months while TD Ameritrade's parent Chow Shop actually declined over 25% the past six months. Of course, it's not really an apple to apple comparison because Chow Shop is also involved in the banking business as well. But you get my point. All in all, they are still rather profitable, operating well, expanding to new markets like Japan and Australia and just overall growing at almost the same pace as their peer. That's a bloody good sign or signs if you ask me. And in fact, analysts from Morningstar actually think they are currently undervalued as of the recording of this video. And they think their fair value is actually worth almost 30% more than what they are worth today. Of course, take this with a pinch of salt. 
this is just the analyst's opinion. We can also expect them to continue their growth as they start rolling out options trading for the US market, which is another segment that attracts a lot of retail traders. So this is definitely a good plus point to their future earnings. And oh, just a sneak peek for you if you have stayed until here. They have briefly mentioned in their earnings call that they do have expansion plans in their pipelines. They are hoping to expand to two new markets. Both are in Asia this year. They think that the total addressable market for these two potential markets will be very meaningful. I mean, here's a map of the Asia continent. Comment down below which two Asian countries do you think they will most likely expand to? They are now already in Hong Kong, China, Japan and Singapore. I will see you in the comment section down below. So yeah, that pretty much summarizes Momo or to be exact, Futu's current financial health, performance and future growth plans. I do think it's a very exciting time for younger brokers like them to continue thriving even in the face of a potential recession because I firmly believe that profitable companies like them that continue to invest aggressively in the bear market and expanding will eventually come out even stronger when the bull market finally returns. Anyway, do let me know in the comments down below if you found this video helpful. Thank you for watching and as usual, I will see you in the next one.